Good morning, everybody. I need to start with an apology for speaking in English. Unlike many British people, I do have another language, but it's not German, unfortunately. I was delighted to be invited to take part in this conference, and I'd like to thank the hosts and conference organisers for inviting me. There's a, a series of children's novels by Lemony Snicket called A Series of Unfortunate Events, and I think in the global economy since 2008, we have experienced just that kind of series of unfortunate events where one terrible thing after another has happened. And it's uh, natural to ask, in that case, where the economists have been. If your boiler leaks, you expect the plumber to mend it. If your tooth aches, the dentist is going to cure it for you. So why haven't the economists been able to fix the economy? I have to confess to you that when economists meet privately these days, we'll often whisper to each other, isn't it all really interesting? These are fascinating times. Handel's Blatt has become exciting reading. Every day brings something new to think about. And it isn't only economists who want to understand what's going on. There's been an increase in the number of students applying to study economics at university. There's a strong appetite for popular books and lectures about economics. Even Her Majesty the Queen, and I hope we've got a picture of her, Can we have the next one too? Oh, you're going to let me drive it myself, thank you. Even Her Majesty the Queen. I, as an aside, it's very hard to find an image of the Queen doing anything other than smiling radiantly, but I think here she was watching one of her horses lose the race. <laughs> but even Her Majesty has shown an interest in why economists didn't predict the crisis. She went to open a new building at the London School of Economics and rather uh, took aback the economists who were showing her around by saying, well, why didn't you predict what was going to happen? She was too polite to say so directly, but a lot of people blame economists and economics, the subject, as the title of this, this session indicates. And some of the criticism has been fierce. The filmmaker Charles Ferguson made a movie called Inside Job, which absolutely savaged economists as being essentially corrupt, and directly responsible for the financial crisis. And the rest of us squirmed when we saw how he treated the economists who were unlucky enough to have been interviewed for the film. So I'm torn between my quiet exhilaration at how interesting things have become and a nagging doubt. I didn't do economic forecasting. I've never worked in finance. But am I somehow to blame for the crisis just because I'm an economist? Has my profession just because of the way it thinks about the economy, caused all of its damage. Is it my fault? We have to ask ourselves this question. And a lot of people think so. A lot of the criticisms they make of economics have been made in the past. Professor Schluter referred to the post-autistic economics movement, the real-world economics movement it calls itself now. It's gaining prominence, but it's been around for quite a while. The difference now is that the crisis seems to be proof that the criticisms are true. But they're not so easy now for the mainstream of the economics profession to just shrug off. And actually, I would say most economists are, on the contrary, taking the critique very seriously now. So what I'd like to do today is present to you with a paradox. Economics is both in crisis and, at the same time, experiencing a very fruitful renaissance. There's already a new approach emerging like a butterfly out of its chrysalis. It's much less tied to a specific theoretical approach. It's more pragmatic, it's more empirical. And it's rooted in a lot of work that already has been going on for some time, but has been more or less hidden from public view. And it's vital for the contribution of economics to the real world that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. So I will start with talking about the crisis and the problems it's demonstrated with economics as a subject and the influence economists have been having on public policy for the past generation. And then I'll describe the way economics itself has been changing for a couple of decades, making it much more useful and also more modest as a discipline. And then finally, I'll explain how to reconcile these two elements. The answer being that there's quite a fundamental reappraisal of the basic methodology and assumptions by economists themselves. And although it predates the crisis, the crisis has certainly accelerated it. Now, there's a well-known joke about economics 
Two friends are walking along, and one of them spots a 50 euro note on the, on the floor. I could only find a picture of a dollar bill, so use your imagination. Look, he says, let's pick up the money. But his friend, who's an economist, replies, don't bother, if it were really there, somebody would have picked it up already. <laughs> the joke, of course, is about the lack of realism in the assumptions economists conventionally make in order to analyze the real world. And it's a very long-standing area of criticism. Sometimes people object to using mathematics in economic models at all, but I think they misunderstand what you have to do to apply statistics to, to any model. But sometimes it's a wider concern about the underlying assumption, in particular that people and firms make their choices by rational and selfish calculation, because isn't that just obviously not true? In practice, the version of the assumption that people use isn't nearly that strong. In practice, it's more like, given the limited information people have, given the various transaction costs in different courses of action, given that the future is uncertain, we'll assume that broadly, people act in their own self-interest, however they define that themselves. And I would strongly defend the use of that contingent version of the standard assumption, because it's a really powerful analytical tool. There's a rightly famous paper by the economist Mansa Olson called Big Builds on the Sidewalk, Why Some Nations Are Rich and Others Poor. It's a reference to the old joke. Ideas and capital can move freely around the world. And uh, the logic of self-interested rationality therefore suggests that there's obvious untapped economic potential in very poor countries. But instead of just concluding that poor people are irrational, we conclude instead that there's an explanation in terms of systematic differences in economic institutions and policies in different countries. And these differences are based on trans transactions, costs, and externalities that account for the apparent inefficiencies. Modern institutional economics, which is a, a thriving area of research, is founded on this use of the rationality assumption as a tool of analysis. If people don't seem to be making the rational choice, then looking at the difference between what would happen if they did do and what they're actually doing is really instructive. Now there is, as everybody knows, a great deal of evidence, as if we needed evidence, that people don't behave like rational calculating machines. We are not all like Mr. Spock in Star Trek, who is actually the ideal economic man. Trouble is, he's half Vulcan. The idea of banded rationality um, acknowledges that there are transactions costs, so people will use rules of thumb. And behavioural economics, which has become very fashionable, um, uses much greater psychological realism, and I'm going to say a bit more about that later. But I would still defend using the assumption of rational choice as long as you realise that it's not a description of reality. But there's one area, of course, where economists have made the mistake of taking rationality to describe reality, and that's unfortunately in the financial markets, where um, uh, practitioners and policymakers have acted for uh, some decades as if the strong form of the efficient markets hypothesis was true. In other words, that prices in the markets instantly reflect all of the relevant information about the future, although it obviously isn't uh, a reflection of reality. What's more, a political philosophy grabbed hold of this idea and took it as proof that, in general, markets left themselves will pretty much deliver uh, better economic outcomes. This was translated as the deregulation of markets, especially financial markets, but more broadly, and became entwined with the growing importance of the financial sector in the economy globally. So politics fed that trend, and the computer and communications revolution fed that trend as well, by making more and more financial market transactions possible and creating new financial markets. I think an honest, conventionally trained economist has to acknowledge that we grew intellectually lazy about this. Although we all knew at some level that the rational choice assumption was um, being made to carry too much weight, very few economists openly challenged its use in everyday public policy decisions. Very few of us use it that way in our own work, as I've just described. But not all that many economists challenged the public rhetoric we even thought about it very much, and so rational choice became a habit of thought rather than the kind of constructive analytical tool that I was just describing. And one result is that a lot of the public 
think that all economists are right-wing free marketeers who don't care about inequality. Uh, this chap on the right obviously works in the financial markets. The Occupy movements, for example, would blame economics for more than just the financial crisis, in particular for the much greater inequality that now characterises almost all the OECD economies. In fact, survey evidence suggests that left-of-centre economists outnumber right-of-centre economists by about three to one, although that's much less than the ratio in other social sciences. But as I just said, a particular ideological version of economics became a framework for analysing public policy quite broadly, and mainstream economists didn't challenge that very much. We got on with our own work, and we ignored the importance of the public rhetoric. There's an interesting concept in linguistic philosophy, performativity. And this refers to the phenomenon when saying something constitutes the act. So when the pastor says, I pronounce you man and wife, that is the act of marriage. If I bump into you and I say, I'm sorry, that is the act of apology. And some sociologists have suggested that performativity characterise, characterises economics as well. In the financial markets, Donald McKenzie at Edinburgh University has pointed out that financial markets of option pricing actually created options markets because you couldn't have the market until somebody had worked out how to calculate the prices. A looser version is that rational choice economic models over time led people to behave more and more like Mr Spock and less and less like people. If regulations assume that you're going to behave in a certain way, then surely there must be a temptation to live up to the assumptions. I don't know if this theory of economic performativity is true, and I don't think you can test the causality very easily. Perhaps it runs from the politics to the economic models instead. Um, so we can't test it, but I think it's a possibility worth considering. Critics also really dislike what they see as the reductionism of economics. The philosophy that the economy as a whole can be understood by looking at the behaviour of an individual profit or income maximising person and adding it up. And I think economists would certainly acknowledge that there are lots of occasions when the assumption is not valid. But it's used as a matter of practicality, of simplicity. Again, though, it was very much taken for granted. And I think the crisis, so strongly marked by herd behaviour, has very much uh, underlined its limitations. So for these reasons, the, um, the financial and economic crisis certainly spells a crisis for some areas of economics or approaches to economics. And I think financial economics and macroeconomics, the study of the whole economy, are particularly vulnerable. They're the areas where the consequences of the standard assumptions have been particularly damaging. Because they're the least valid, actually, financial market traders aren't remotely like Mr Spock making rational calculations unaffected by emotion or the behaviour of others. Macro, the study of these millions of individual decisions, is, is essentially ideological. How a macroeconomist replies now to the question, what is the effect of cutting the budget deficit on growth? It depends on their political views, actually. It's not remotely an area of hard science. And the consensus about macroeconomics during what's been described as the great moderation of the 1990s has entirely broken down. Now, observers of the profession think that macroeconomics is what economists do, particularly forecasting. Actually, relatively few of us do any forecasting at all. And that prominence in the public eye is because media interviews tend to focus on, on forecasts, what do you think will happen next? In reality, economic forecasts about variables like inflation, growth, financial market prices are just based on the past. They are clever ex extrapolations of the past. And any, any model after a year or two will predict that growth will be the same as its average in the past. These are conventional models that are used in finance ministries and central banks everywhere, and they're inherently unable to predict dramatic changes. But there's a good reason that forecasters take that approach, and it's because it's too hard to do anything else. Understanding and forecasting the aggregate behaviour of all these millions of decisions is much harder than weather forecasting. Because not only do you have to incorporate the effect that people's decisions have on each other, but also their expectations of the future and how that affects today's decisions. And there's a very real sense in which we think ourselves into a recession or a boom because of what we expect to happen in a way that individual water particles in the atmosphere never think themselves into a thundercloud. So no wonder macro forecasts always seem to be wrong, 
and a sensible economist will obey the rule, predict what's going to happen or when it's going to happen, but never both at the same time. The kind of conventional macroeconomics that pretends to greater confidence about the future is, is greatly flawed, and macro has become a political argument rather than an empirical science, just as it was in the 1970s, and I think the great moderation made macroeconomists econ complacent. So that's economic methodology, and um, I can't uh, finish without talking about a few other more practical problems about economics. They're not so much intellectual as practical problems. And the first one I want to mention is the economics curriculum in universities. In most cases, it pays far too much attention to macroeconomics, on which, as I've just argued, there's no consensus and most economists won't do in their professional careers. Students are often anyway taught one, one worldview in macroeconomics as if it were true. They're not given any intellectual context, any history of economic thought. They learn almost nothing about economic institutions, such as the banking system. They've got little sense of economic history. It used to be a requirement in many PhD programmes, but it's even been dropped from most of those. As the present crisis followed a long period of unusual stability, you might have thought it was important to teach the current generation about large economic fluctuations, such as the 1970s and the 1930s, before immersing them in dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models. That isn't done. I say all this with confidence because actually I have a son who's just in his final year of an economics degree. He's not doing macro yet, I can tell you. Um, students also are not taught systematically aspects of the subject that their future employers are already trying to apply. For eight years, I was on the competition authority in the United Kingdom, and we became well aware, as soon as behavioural economics started to have an impact, that that had very strong implications for potential remedies in competition and merger inquiries. So, for example, if you're hoping that uh, a remedy based on increasing competition by increasing, increasing consumer choice would be effective, then understand, understanding the limitations of consumer choice is very important. There's already quite a large amount of research on the psychology of consumer choice, and it would be useful for students to learn a bit about this. I don't think very much of that is being taught. The second point about the teaching is that undergraduates are taught as if they're all planning to go and study for a doctorate and become an academic economist. The curriculum doesn't really acknowledge that most of them, if they stick with it, are going to become applied microeconomists. They'll go and work for government, for regulatory bodies, for business, for consultancies, Maybe they'll work in the city. But they're not given um, a good enough grounding in the careful handling of data and the kind of econometrics that they will need to use in their jobs. And the result is, is too much poor quality empirical work being done by economists who are working in government and business. This uh, crisis seems to have prompted employers to um, become interested in the curriculum and, and what economics graduates are learning. Obviously, the interest today is one example of that. I'm organising a conference in the UK next month, co-hosted by the Government Economic Service and the Bank of England, who are major employers of economists in, in my country, bringing together employers and academics for a discussion about reforming how economics is taught. And it's probably worth considering what a, a completely different kind of economics degree would look like, one that regarded it as a professional vocation, more like law or medicine, than purely as an academic subject. And I think in that case, professional ethics would then be a natural part of the territory. There's recently been some discussion about um, professional ethics for economists, but I found, I found it a slightly odd debate. For example, the American Econ Economic Association last month proposed uh, a code of ethics, uh, a set of guidelines for economists working in universities about disclosing their sources of research funding and external appointments. This was something that the movie Inside Job criticised particularly severely. But there seems to be nothing that's specifically about economics in that. Surely researchers in any discipline ought to disclose their potential conflicts of interest. But if an economics degree is regarded more as a vocational training, then a professional code of ethics with direct relevance to that seems more natural and appropriate. And David Colander at Middlebury, Middlebury College in the United States has, has recently proposed just such a code modelled on a professional code for engineers. Final point about practical problems is that 
these undercooked economics graduates I've been describing often go on to work in government. And economists have come to have a particularly influential role in public policy, certainly compared to other social scientists. In the UK, we have a chief economist in almost every government department, but no chief anthropologists or chief psychologists, as far as I know. There's a good reason for this special status, and I'm going to talk about some of the good reasons in a few minutes. But the influence economists have in government needs seasoning with a corresponding degree of humility. And I think one of the side effects of the crisis will be to make economists quite a bit more humble, and that will be a good thing. Now, so far, probably not many of you have been disagreeing with me. There's a, there's a ready market for criticism of economists at the moment. So I'm now going to become a bit more contrarian and talk about some of the strengths, some of the distinctive strengths of economics as opposed to other subjects. The first of these is a counterpart to the limitations I was just talking about. It's that economics is almost brutally analytical and logical in a world where there's no shortage of fuzzy thinking and emotion. And I want to give just a few examples out of many. <coughs> Accounting identities. They play a really important part in economics. Ex post, after the event, the balance of payments will have balanced. If a country has a current account surplus, it will turn out to have exported more capital than it imports. When you think about the American debate, which demonizes China as simultaneously having a trade surplus and sucking in all the investment and creating jobs there instead of in the United States, logically, that's not possible. China must have been a net overseas investor. OK, different form of investment, not direct investment. But it's a matter of accountancy. And the same goes for Germany, another account, current account surplus country. Conversely, for the UK, running a consistent deficit on the current account means we are consistently a net importer of capital to finance that domestic spending. Another example with some relevance now of powerful arithmetic. A highly indebted country that has to pay a real rate of interest to foreign lenders that's higher than its real growth rate will never reduce its level of debt. The magic yield for um, debt sustainability isn't 7%, as quite a lot of the comment has been implying. If you're pessimistic about growth prospects in the um, troubled countries, a bond yield as low as 3% might result in a growing debt burden, even if the austerity measures are tough enough to get the government back to budget balance. The powerful levers for resolving debt crises are inflation and growth, not austerity. Another area of inconvenient truth at the heart of economics is the concept of opportunity cost. It's really simple. Economics is about the allocation of scarce resources to different uses. Opportunity cost says that using resources for one thing makes them unavailable for another thing, whether the resource is tax revenue or coal or time. That's all it says. It's a statement of the physical reality of the universe. It's a highly unpopular thing to say in public policy discussion. This kind of hard-headedness dates back to the start of economics. David Hume is writing about the balance of payments and the implications for capital flows in the, in the 18th century. But for much of the time since Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations in 1759, 18, 1759, the development of economics has been limited by lack of empirical evidence. This is almost as young a science as other historical sciences like geology or evolutionary biology. But until recently, we've lacked anything like as much data as these other non-experimental historical sciences. Take the question of growth. Why do some countries grow rapidly with the implications for health and longevity and living standards that that implies? and other countries stay very poor. It must be the most basic question in economics. <coughs> but the concept of GDP wasn't developed until the late 1930s, so not until then could we start measuring in an aggregate way the economy. And not until about 1980 was there data for more than a small number of countries dating back at least half a century. So a lot of the early work on growth was using, I don't know, 600 data points, and you can't test very sophisticated theories using that little data. So it's not surprising economists have been for a long time overly focused on abstract models. 
Now, that situation has been changing spectacularly in the past 20 years or so. And the reason is the computer revolution and the availability of databases, the computer power to use those databases, and new statistical techniques to make valid inference from different types and structures of data. Just recently, the UK's Economic and Social Science Research Council announced it was making freely available online the 200 large-scale data sets that it has funded, and another 700 provided by researchers who've had ESRC grants. Every national statistical office, but especially the US authorities and the international authorities, now makes <clears throat> plentiful data available. Usually economic researchers will publish their data or, or, or give it to people so their work can be assessed and validated. Online surveys, mobile phone apps mean it's even possible to collect data and create new data sets in a way that previously wasn't. And it's really easy to underestimate how important this is. This is uh, the computer that I used when I was a graduate student. It's a DEC VMS Vax. When I was a PhD student in the early 1980s, Access to both the data and the computer time was costly. Sometimes you had to load the data from a big magnetic tape onto the computer. I had to write my own regression programs in Fortran because the commercial software was quite limited. Each regression had to run overnight, one by one, because that was the time the computer was cheap to use. You chose your thesis subject depending on whether or not there was any data available on what you were interested in, or you did a theoretical thesis instead. The combined computer processing and information revolution is absolutely transformational, and it's still in its infancy in terms of its eventual impact on economic knowledge and on the science of economics. This isn't the only area where there's been quite dramatic change, and there are a number of others of uh, other areas of method methodological change which together will also end up having quite a dramatic effect on the state of economics. And I'll mention them in roughly descending order of the support they get from the academic mainstream at the moment. I've already touched on behavioural economics, drawing on results from psychological experiments. And they demonstrate very clearly some non-rational choice making. A lot of critics of e economics love behavioural economics because they think it disproves the subject. But many economists are very interested in the rules of thumb that emerge from the research programme. Because although rationality is a convenient assumption, and it can be an illuminating one, as I was arguing earlier, I don't think any economist would hesitate to drop or modify the rationality assumption as we come to understand more realistic decision processes. I recently attended a workshop at the Toulouse School of Economics that brought together economists on the one hand and psychologists and cognitive scientists on the other. Scientists are starting to learn about how the structure of the brain affects the allocation of attention. Ironically, it seems to be a free market competition between neurons subject to an energy constraint, so a lot of the conventional economic models might actually fit what neurons do very well. But the upshot is that um, the mind, the eye is not a camera, the brain doesn't take in everything that happens in the world. Actually, we're very uh, parsimonious in what we pay attention to. And there's a famous experiment um, with the invisible gorilla. You might know this video, it's become quite well known. And if you haven't seen it, it's well worth having a look online. But the experiment shows that if you ask people to concentrate on one thing, the people in the t-shirts, they don't, a great majority don't notice at all the gorilla in the image. They just don't notice the gorilla. The invisible gorilla is a really powerful demonstration of the limits to rational choice between alternatives. And the economists at the workshop were really hungry for what systematic conclusions you could draw from this. But the psychologists don't have them yet. They don't know. It's at the early stages of this research program. What we do know from an accumulation of research is that, in some circumstances, conventional, rational choice economic models apply extremely well. Whether that's mobile phone companies bidding in a spectrum for, uh, an auction for spectrum, or whether it's rhesus monkey, monkeys bargaining for food in their cage. But in other circumstances, the rules of thumb decision patterns of behavioural economics fit much better. This is a really active area of research. It might lead to better public policies. There's already a lot of interest in the idea of nudging people to different forms of behaviour, even on the basis of the quite limited knowledge we have at present. <clears throat> 
it will certainly lead in time, I think, to better economic theory and evidence. Uh, and to repeat, I don't think economists will hesitate at all to abandon rational choice when that's at odds with the evidence and, and not even useful as an analytical lever in the way that I was describing at the start. A second innovation is experiments, experimental methods in economics, either in the psychological experiments I talked about or in uh, randomised control trials. Um, they've been used extensively now in development economics. And this is an image taken from a fantastic book called Poor Economics by Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo. And they talk about the application of randomised control trials in lots of contexts, including schooling in India. The use of trials hasn't been universally embraced by economists. The doubts centre on um, whether you can generalise the results to other contexts apart from the specific ones in which the trial took place. But nevertheless, it would be natural to extend this methodology to policy trials here at home. Why would you care more about effective spending of aid money than about any other form of government spending? Although I would note that firm evidence on the effectiveness or not of some favourite policy prescriptions might not be particularly welcome by everybody. There are other innovations in terms of analytical tools as well. Game theory was an early example and I think is now universally acknowledged as a powerful approach to modelling and predicting behaviour and one with particular relevance for business strategy. Others are more on the fringe, but interest in them is growing. They'd include using fractals in financial markets, non-linear mathematics and complexity theory, network theory and agent-based modelling. A third point about methodology is the growing interest of some economists in interdisciplinary work. And this is not universal. In fact, I would say quite a few economists think that their colleagues doing interdisciplinary work are watering down the subject or straying outside its proper boundaries. And I know that there are some universities where there's quite a lot of tension between these two perspectives. And none of the interdisciplinary areas is absolutely new. Urban economics, economic geography is one example, Psycho psychological research, economic sociology, Political economy, in the conventional sense, has, for obvious reasons, experienced a revival since the crisis. But all of these are very active areas now, and there's a lot of interesting work being done in them. Perhaps the crisis has directly prompted some researchers to look at areas outside the core of their discipline, or perhaps there was a pre-existing discontent with the perceived narrowness of economics that has been amplified by the crisis. Either way, a lot of interesting work there. So, at the same time as defending their profession against extreme criticism, which is a kind of natural psychological reaction when people tell you it's all your fault and how bad you are, economists have to varying degrees started to respond to the criticisms in their own professional practice. It's said that if you laid all the economists in the world end to end, they still wouldn't reach a conclusion. So I'm not going to exaggerate the degree of uh, consensus uh, uh, about the implications of the crisis for the subject. But I think it's certainly the case that the crisis has triggered, and quite rightly, triggered a debate. Some economists have been quite vocal and in insisting that there's nothing wrong with the conventional assumptions. And this includes Eugene Farmer, if he comes. There he is. He's the Chicago-based father of the efficient markets hypothesis. Interviewed about what the financial turmoil implied for the efficient markets hypothesis, this is in 2010, he said, I think it did quite well. Stock prices typically de decline pri prior to and in a state of recession. This was a particularly severe recession. Prices started to decline in advance when people recognised that it was a recession and then continued. That's exactly what you would expect if the market, market was efficient. So no signs of doubt from him. Other economists, like Paul Krugman, have been insistent on the need for new thinking, some even a new paradigm. Krugman doesn't go quite that far, but he's written of the need for a fundamental change, abandoning the long-standing ambition for a consistent, unified theoretical framework. He says many economists will find these changes disturbing. It will be a long time, if ever, before the new, more realistic approaches to finance and macroeconomics offer the same kind of clarity, completeness, and um, sheer beauty that characterises the full neoclassical approach. To some economists, that will be a reason to cling to neoclassicism, cla neoclassicism, despite its utter failure to make sense of the greatest economic crisis in three generations. <laughs> 
This seems, however, a good time to recall the words of H. L. Mencken. There is always an easy solution to every human problem, neat, plausible, and wrong. So this division of opinion certainly shows that economics isn't monolithic, as some of its, of its critics have claimed. But this more or less ideological difference between groups like these is a symptom of the terminal state of conventional macroeconomics. I don't believe conventional macro can survive the crisis in its present form, nor in its 1970s Keynesian revival either. We have to go back to the drawing board to understand the aggregate behaviour of the economy and the financial markets. And some of the most creative thinking, um, ecological models, network theory, agent-based computer models, come out of intellectual traditions that are brand new to economics. And it's very encouraging to see that kind of work going on, although it's not the kind that most macroeconomists are yet doing. The rest of economics, in fact most of it in other words, is in a pretty healthy state. Applied micro isn't torn by completely different ideologies and worldviews in that same way. There are normal scientific disagreements. And I tried to give an indication earlier of why I think most applied economics has entered such a fruitful period. And I thought I'd end with a few examples. I already mentioned the spectrum auctions designed by economists and game theorists drawing on some experimental work in the laboratory. There's a broader market design approach Economists are designing effective congestion charging um, schemes, transport pricing mechanisms, uh, environmental trading schemes. The carbon trading market's not doing so well, but uh, this graph shows a steep decline in the deforestation in the Brazilian rainforest following the introduction of a scheme designed by economists um, to allow the sale of lawful leases. So it, the illegal logging has stopped and there's legal trading going on instead. Economists designed the bonds that allowed the Global Alliance on Vaccines and Immunisation to raise $3 billion since 2006. Search companies like Google employ economists to work on their advertising and, and page ranking algorithms, and last time I looked, Google had quite decent profits. Now, not all economists are very good. Like any profession, you get a range of ability. But my point is that the bread and butter work that applied economists do is absolutely thriving and actually is more useful than ever to businesses and governments and regulators because of the relatively recent advances in techniques and data. It would be really ironic and, and unfortunate if the crisis causes people to distrust economics at exactly the time when it has so much more to offer. This is one reason that we economists have to put our house in order now and acknowledge our collective faults. It's no good making criticisms without suggesting a few solutions, so I thought I'd end with a few reforms that I think the discipline of economics needs. As I said, you can predict a macroeconomist's views about the economy from his political views and vice versa. They're bringing us into disrepute. Instead of going on TV to state, state with confidence they know what will happen and criticise the government or the opposition, delete as appropriate, they need to be more humble about what they know. Economists who are genuinely interested about the economy and the aggregate will open their minds to new approaches, as there's nothing like consensus on this part of the subject. Secondly, it's probably obvious already that I think curriculum reform is important. And the top priorities are the teaching of practical statistics and econometrics and a wider view of economic history and institutions. Academics in general don't have good incentives to teach well. It would be good to see that improved. I'd also like to see universities, and in particular research funders, encourage innovation in the discipline to ensure that academic economists in the mainstream don't just draw up the barricades, because there is naturally uh, a tendency to have a psychological reaction to very severe criticism. In the UK, there's been an absolutely dramatic increase in the number of school students interested in economics. Um, to study in the sixth form, the numbers are up by 55% since 2006. And I would hate to see that enthusiasm, interest and passion squeezed out of them by unreformed courses when they get to university. Thirdly, like any area of expertise, economics has its special jargon. And economists like to safeguard their status by appearing to have some arcane private knowledge. But our subject affects people's lives very directly. And we have great power in public policy compared to other experts. And the crisis has completely undermined confidence in what we say. This combination means we have a special responsibility at the moment 
to explain clearly what economics brings to any specific issue. And as a popularizer of economics, it will be obvious that I think communication is important, but now more so than ever. I hope the crisis will strengthen economics by stimulating reform from within. Most economists I've ever met, and that's a lot over the years, are actually very practical. They're not abstract ivory tower people. They're passionate about using their knowledge to improve the world, and they're keen to test their theories against the evidence, even if you some, sometimes need to knock the evidence into shape first. In the end, the data explosion is what makes me optimistic, that we will see the subject evolve in really important ways. Although there's no doubt that political views and uh, a, a theoretical framework colour the way economists work, fundamentally, economics remains the same subject it always has. It's the application of enlightenment empiricism to human societies to understand how they allocate and use and, and share resources. And I'm just going to end with a plug for my book. There's a lot more on e the nature of economics in The Soulful Science, which Olaf kindly mentioned at the start. Thank you very much. Thank you.